Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. My name is Kirk Barrett. My job here is to bring you the best thinkers, the best knowledge, the best expertise in this wonderful profession of dentistry. And when you think about credentialing, is it more complex than ever? The answer is yes. Like, what do we need to know about credentialing in dentistry? And so I brought on Shelly DeGroff, who's an expert in this domain, and we ask her the questions. Listen up. I know you guys will enjoy this, and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam around here. My job is to find the greatest experts, thinkers, teachers, influencers in this industry to help you create a better practice and a better life. And on the subject of credentialing, which is incredibly complex, I've got one of our regular friends here, Shelly DeGroff from PPO Advisors to help us navigate this difficult terrain. So Shelly, thanks for being on. I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Now, I we're going to talk about this, and like I shared with you before we hit the go button, I just love having you on here because I don't even want to try to understand this. I shared with you, you are an expert in one of the most difficult subjects ever in dentistry, and so I, I know you've been on the podcast before, but I want you to share who you are uh, before we get into this subject uh, in case somebody hasn't heard before when you were on previously. So who's Shelly DeGroff? What do you, get, what do, you do? Uh, we are PPO advisors, so we do everything credentialing, negotiating contracts and, and fee schedules, anything to do with insurance, we want to be the expert. So we want to be able to educate, guide, and uh, really give offices a chance to understand what we know. So we're there to just share, share all the knowledge we can. And share you do. I love this. And so um, take us through the basics. Like, what do I need to know about? Well, actually, let's start with the why, the why of credentialing. So give us the, you know, the state of the union on what that is and why right now. All right. So why? Why do we credential? Well, we credential because most of our patients that we see anymore have insurance and they want to go to an in-network provider, right? Um, the statistics are changing though. So it used to be where there was only 7% fee for service the last couple, two years. That statistic has changed and we're growing to see more and more fee for service, which is great. I like seeing that. Um, the latest statistic is around like 18, 19% fee for service practices back into the US. Um, but still, we have a ton of providers graduating out every year and there are more and more providers building their own practices, joining as associates, and they need to be busy. And so the why there is getting in network with insurances and credentialing and becoming an in-network provider. So uh, there with the becoming a credentialed provider, it's a process. It's a process that has uh, gotten increasingly difficult over the years. They don't make it easy. They don't want it to be easy, uh, but they do want you to be in network and they really push for providers to be in network and for patients to go to in-network providers. You know, the insurance companies, they send their EOBs out to the patients with if you'd have gone to an in-network provider, your savings would have been X. And here's a list of five providers in your zip code. They're right. promoting in-network. So, you know, it is really hard to stay fee-for-service or to not go in-network. Um, but we certainly don't want people to go in-network with the wrong insurances just out of fear either. Yeah. So go back to that. So it's 7%. And then you said 18 to 19%, which is consistent. Um, with what we hear from other experts, I'm always, I'm yeah. fascinated because every time I get an expert like you in this area, you guys all share the exact percentages are pretty darn close. Give us your hypothesis. <laughs> go back. Why, why and how did it go from 7% to 18 to 19%? What are your, what's your hypothesis? My personal hypothesis is COVID. Um, so right before COVID, we were seeing that 7% and, and now it's 18. So that gave providers time to look at how insurance was impacting their practice when they were shut down. 
right? So they were looking at contracts. They were looking at their dollar values and saying, this isn't working. And a lot of providers started to drop. Wow. And so anyone who says fee for service is dead doesn't know what's going on. No, they don't. And, and I, I really see more of a hybrid. I think, you know, we're not going to see that full on fee for service structure just blow up, but a hybrid of dropping lots of uh, PPO plans that are not working for practices and keeping just a very few in network policies. I think that's the new way that everybody's going to start to trend. Totally agree. Totally agree. So take us down this path. Let's start the credentialing process. Like how long does this really take? It takes a long time, much longer than what you're going to anticipate as a provider. So uh, associates that are graduating out here in, the, in this month, you know, most providers that are uh, getting ready to graduate, they're not going to actually get their license until June or July. So they can't even start the credentialing process until they have a license. And that means from there, it's going to take an additional with the insurance companies, 30 to on up to 120 days, 30 days at best, which we rarely see a contract go through in 30 days. Um, That's, that's not normal. And especially for a brand new provider. So when you go through the credentialing process, they are verifying that you don't have malpractice, that you truly do exist and that you have a dental license and, um, you know, there's nothing risky about you as a provider being in their network. So the vetting process that first time definitely takes a lot longer than your second go around with either a recredential or I'm going back into network after deciding to have termed, um, you know, maybe several years ago. So uh, new providers, they really need to expect, um, and especially if they're going with umbrella companies or third party contracts, that process always takes about six months. That's the number I'm going to give you. Okay. So that problem alone creates other problems. I'm a dentist. So many. You know, let's say I'm a dentist. I'm bringing in a new provider who's going through credentialing. That is way too long, Mm Shelly. So why, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to submit under somebody else's. And and now we all know, like, take us down that path. That's dangerous, right? Very dangerous. Wow. So, and NPI fraud. So right there, you're committing NPI fraud. NPI fraud is identity fraud. It's it's a fraud where you are saying I am the provider of service, and this is my claim that I am submitting as the provider of service who did all the work when you weren't that provider. So now the insurance companies who you know data mine every single thing you submit. They know how many claims on average a provider is submitting in, the types of procedures that they typically do on a daily basis. They have an idea of exactly how this practice functions. And then all of a sudden, all of that doubles because the provider is now submitting claims in as the associate as well. They find that out immediately. And that is when they start digging in, red flagging the practice and start to look at things. Now. Most practices get caught on NPI fraud through a Medicare or a Medicaid audit first, and then it explodes from there. So those rack audits that the the Medicare and Medicaid send out, that's where those get caught. And so you, when you are doing NPI fraud, identity fraud, and you're defrauding the government, they like to make a case out of you. And, and scare everybody else. So it's definitely something you want to stay away from. It's very easy to catch NPI fraud. Yeah. And is this a big deal? I mean, does it happen? Are, are there small cases in this or is this pretty widespread? Give us a scope of that. <laughs> I see it a lot. I, mm-hmm. I hate to uncover that, but I see it a lot. Um, there are small cases where we've had instances where, you know, yeah, providers been submitting um, under, you know, an associate's been submitting under an owning doctor for a little bit and an insurance company catches it because you know what the insurance companies are doing? They're trying to recruit providers, right? So they're looking at directories on websites and saying, well, I don't have that doctor on our register, why is it listed on their website? And so then they're calling and they're saying, hey, do you have more providers than just Dr. So-and-so? And in those cases, when a recruiter's trying to find doctors to get their quotas, they may use that to their advantage, let it slide, get them, you know, get them credentialed, and we'll just 
forget that that ever happened. Unfortunately, that's kind of how the system works. Then there's other cases where the fraud is so big, um, it was caught by you know a rack audit first that these providers are facing prison time, fines that they can't recover from, loss of license forever. Um, you know, there's some big red flags that go with this. So we certainly don't want to encourage providers to even play with the idea of it. Yeah. So would you say probably best practice is just recognize the period of time this is going to take. And there's really not a whole lot you can do until the process is complete, correct? For those new providers coming out of school, no, because they don't have a license. So I mean, we, there's nothing that can be submitted until the license is in. Um, but for providers that you know are switching associateships and they've been credentialed in the past, um, no, I mean, it's still going to take time to get them credentialed. It may not take as long, but one, they can at least start the process significantly sooner. So as soon as a letter of intent is signed with an associate that has all of their credentials, their license, their DEA, all of the things that are needed, then the credentialing process can start. So even if that contract for the associate doesn't start for 90 days down the road, still start credentialing them so that that time frame is narrowed down. Um, the other thing though, is providers can see patients as out of network. There's that, that thought of, well, if we're out of network, we just can't see anybody. They can only see the fee for service patients. And that's not true. They can see patients that are in network as an out of network provider, out of network benefits will be utilized and you can give insurance patients a discount so long as the discount is shared with the insurance company. So you can put on the claim form that we're providing a 10%, 20% discount to the insurance patient to offset that out of network benefit that they're utilizing. So there's ways to work with patients so that they understand that, hey, this is what's going on. And the practice is taking care of the additional out-of-pocket expense that they're taking on to be seen as an out-of-network patient. Yeah, that's really good to know. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Now the next question becomes what to credential? Like t talk about the what. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so there's so many plans out there and it's overwhelming. Um, you know, this, this fear of we need to be a network with everybody, right? So that we can gain as many patients is really not what I want our clients to be doing. I want our clients to credential with what is necessary for their demographic to be successful long-term, meaning looking at insurance companies that negotiate, insurance companies that have a record of increases annually or uh, at least every two years that are substantial enough to keep you at a sustainable rate. Um, this going in network with everything because one patient asked for you to be in network sometimes doesn't make sense. And there's a connection between all of the insurance companies. They're all connected one way or another. So when a provider says, well, yeah, I'll go and network with your insurance company, you may also be going and network with six, seven, 20, 30 other insurance companies from that one agreement. And that's where then you start to really fall into the cycle of now we're network with everything. We don't know where it's coming from. The fees are getting out of control and you start to feel overwhelmed. So we don't want providers to just blindly decide this is who we're going in network. There needs to be a why. Why am I going in network with this insurance company? There are X amount of employers that have this insurance company in my area. Um, you know, typically you want the city's insurance, you want the school's insurance, you want the hospitals, um, typically the fire departments and the um, police departments fall under the city. So, you know, those big employer groups, look into those in your demographic, know who their insurance is with and start there and then figure out those contracts. What else am I getting from those before we just start this spiral of accepting everything? Yeah. And the spiral starts to happen. You know, again, this is your area of expertise and you shared a little bit of this last time. Is there any, are there any new ways to figure this puzzle out other than just auditing EOBs on a regular basis? Is there any, do you have a, any other methods? So the insurance companies should give you a payer list when you sign up to be a network with them. So when you sign up with Guardian, they send you a fee schedule and their payer list. All of the other insurances you get 
with being in network with them. So on a yearly basis, you should be asking for the payer list from the insurance company. So you have an idea of what new networks have come into play, which ones may have fallen off. Um, and that's with every insurance company. So all insurance companies have a payer list. Most of them don't give them out unless you're asking for it. So um, it's, it's super important to have a copy of those. And then yes, looking at your EOB to verify how the claim was paid. And that goes back into when I talked about the most favored nations clause. So I don't know if you remember that from last yep. quarter, but the most favored nations clause is what gets every office without them even knowing. It's where these insurance networks that are all connected, right? They're all connected one way or another. Aetna shares to Guardian, Guardian shares to Principal, Principal shares to Emeritus. It's all one big web. So once you sign an agreement with one and it's shared to another, they have the ability to default to the lowest fee schedule in your practice. So if you're not stacking your contracts and making sure they're paying off of the fee schedule you want, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. You're, you're never going to get ahead. Yeah. And so you helped me understand that last time and I Googled it. And so if you're a dentist <laughs> listening to this, you should Google most favored nations clause because it's not just specific to dental insurance. So no. if you, can you describe mm -hmm. what it is? I want everybody listening to Google it so that they can calm themselves a little bit, but describe what it is. Yeah. The most favored nation clause, it's, it's, it's huge, right? It, it really covers everything. And it, it is just an agreement that allows other shared agreements within one agreement to share their information and fee schedules in dental. So that's how it all comes into play for us. But yeah, a lot of people don't think most favorite nation clause even applies to dental. That's a government thing that has something to do with, you know, something bigger than us. And no, it's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I love about learning from you. All, I mean, every time, <laughs> every time I have you on here, you freak me out. And then I also uh, end up Googling a lot. I'm like, Oh my goodness. I learned a ton. I now know yeah, what we that means. Really, we have a good blog right now on the most favorite nation clause on our website. So you can look that up too. And hopefully it'll shed some light. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So we're going to go down this path too. Let's talk about multiple lease share agreements. What do we need yeah, to know absolutely. in regards so to that? So so many ways to contract, right? We have direct contracts, which are going to be directly going with that company. So that's me as a provider directly going to Aetna and saying, I want to be a network with you, with you directly, Aetna. And Aetna says, here's my contract. Here's the agreement. You'll be credentialed with us in 10 weeks. Or as a provider, I can go to Connection Dental. And it's one of the largest umbrella companies or third party administrators. So you'll hear TPAs used a lot. And you can go to Connection and say, I want to be in network with Connection. And through Connection, I'm going to grab Aetna, Emeritus, Principal, United Healthcare, Guardian, and on down the line, right? So now I'm in network with multiple insurances through one contract, one fee schedule. And there's so many ways you can use that to your advantage, but there's so many ways that it hurts a practice because they don't understand the stacking order and that most favored nations clause coming into effect. So when a provider goes in network with Aetna and Guardian and Connection, now there's three ways Aetna can be picked up. Yeah. Right? It's picked up directly. It's picked up through Guardian. It's picked up through Connection. So now Aetna's going to look at all of those agreements and see which one's going to pay less. So even though they got a really good fee schedule negotiated with Aetna when they originally signed up, Guardian may be less. And so they're going to pay those claims that way. So it's figuring out, wait, I'm over credentialing. I'm already in network with so many plans. Maybe I shouldn't be picking up this contract because it's going to override a different contract. So, so Shelly, let me, let me ask you a question. So, I'm going to pretend to be a, a client of yours. And so do you advise people to do this directly because they can be in control of the path and have less, less complexity than maybe going to a third party administrator? I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, not really. So unfortunately, it's a double edged sword. We can go direct for a lot of good reasons. Um, some of the direct contracts have incentive plans. Um, some of the direct contracts, well, they're always going to credential faster than a third party. So a lot of providers that are going through acquisitions, 
um, or you're just in a huge hurry to get credentialed, they feel going direct is a better route because it's, you know, significantly less credentialing time. But on the flip side of that, their fees directly are typically not as competitive as third party fees. Now, that's not always the case. Every demographic is different. So a provider who's going to do their own credentialing really needs to know how they can pick up each insurance company so that they're looking at all of their options and, and deciding from there, this is how I'm going to credential. I'm going to credential with these six companies through this one third party contract. And then I'm going to go direct with MetLife and I'm going to go direct with Humana uh, because they don't pick up through the third party or their direct contracts were just better contracts. Yeah. Um, we look at everything. I mean, whenever I look or talk to a client, it's I'm going to negotiate direct and I'm going to negotiate indirect and we're going to figure it out from there. What's the best plan of action? And then there's also the concept of now a direct contract sometimes tracks a provider. So it used to be you can get out of a contract whenever you wanted. You still can. You can still term a contract that takes 90 days to term a direct contract. But these direct contracts are now putting stipulations in where if you term them directly, it's at their discretion to put a block from you getting picked up through a third party if they want to put that block in place. And so now it's not as black and white as it used to be. It used to be a no brainer. I can, you know, I can term whatever I want. I can readjust this contract to over here. Well, now we have to really look at the big picture to make sure now that that door may not open down the road. So I wouldn't risk contracting direct because of the way their clause is written. I would go indirect for that purpose. So those are the things that we look at when we're credentialing a client. Yeah. And this is why I love having you on. And I'll just tell you as a listener, this game is so complex. That's why you should definitely ask for the help of somebody like Shelly, who understands this and studies this consistently. So <laughs> I want to go back to, um, I love what you said at the beginning. And um, a lot of times when we do a lecture or something, I'm so passionate about freedom and building your own fee. Mm -hmm. Some people do say, well, you want me to be fee for sure. I'm like, no, that's not my point. It's actually really good to think about this in a, in a bigger, you know, in a, in a bigger light. And you mentioned hybrid. So help us understand yeah. what that means. If I'm, if I'm a young dentist, like how could I hybrid this so that it could help me create a better practice and better life maybe over the next 20 years? Right, right. I think the idea was, you know, five years ago as a young provider, I got to be in network with everything in order to build my practice up as quick as possible to catch up to the guys or gals that have been doing this for a lot of years and, and, and be competitive. Now, we really got to look at what that write off looks like first. The national average write off is 45%. That's a big write off. And overhead costs have jumped, used to be 67%. Now it's 74. That's a big jump. So as a new dentist, a young dentist, with overhead as high as it is and write-offs as high as they are, honestly, needing to be that hybrid doctor where we're fee-for-service for some of these big players because it just doesn't pay to take that 50% write-off is actually going to help you become a better sustaining practice than just accepting every insurance company. So uh, we see the trend changing, right? It went from 7% fee for service and it's jumped all the way to 18% in the last couple of years. So I do feel like that number is going to continue to grow, but I'm going to see it grow hopefully more in a hybrid model where providers that have been heavy PPO starting to come in and drop a lot of their insurances that just don't make financial sense for the practice anymore. And then we can strategically make the plan of these are the insurances that need to go. These are the ones we keep looking at the ones that will continue to negotiate over, you know, the next couple of years that will allow them to get out of contracts. All of those will go into play here. And then as they continue to drop a few, you'll continue to do that over the course of several years and then maybe hit that fee for service model. But it's not something you want to jump into, in my opinion. Right. Tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I want you to go back to a couple pieces of data there because, that, again, that's consistent with everything that we hear, 45% write-offs. Okay, describe that. Like, I want you to – that freaks me out. That means 
you're working one out of every day, two days for free for the most part in a model yeah. like that. Is, am I correct in assuming that 45%? Where, where does you're that right. no, you're spot def, on. First of all, define that number. So the, in case somebody doesn't really understand what that means. <laughs> that means that you have a full fee service, right? So your full fee, your master fee for your practice is a hundred dollars for a pro fee. Obviously I'm just throwing out easy math here, hundred dollars for a pro fee. But if the write-off level is 45%, that means you're only getting paid nearly half of that. Yeah. And let's hope you are writing off half of what you do at 45%. And let's hope your team member at the front is at least collecting a hundred percent of that fifty-five dollars. You know, so that's there's right. other, and when you add in the overhead thing, okay, seventy-four percent. That's, I, I mean, a lot of people say have said seventy-one, but seventy-four. That's higher than I've heard in the recent months. Describe that too. What does that mean to me as a Every, dentist? Everything is going up. Employee costs are going up. Have you been on the threads where providers, right. Facebook threads, all these threads of front office came up and asked for an increase? Yeah, they need an increase because the office down the street doesn't have a front office lady anymore and they're willing to hire out. They're taking you know practices uh, staff because it's easy to do that now. So now we're competing with everyone around us on employee costs, right? And then our supply costs and everything. Everything has just tripled over the last, you know, two years we've seen, but yet with our current environment, it seems like it's going even more upward in this inflation rate. So uh, I've been seeing 74%. I think it's a fair assumption to say 71 to 74 is spot on. Um, a lot of it comes down to, do you own your practice? Do you, um, or, you know, do you own your building? Are you leasing right. your building? All of those kind of go into play with interest rates and so forth. So anywhere in that 71 to 74 is, is probably spot on. Yeah. And I'll just say this to maybe the young listener or the, you know, dentist that's been out for a while, you might be a little overwhelmed with that information and don't throw up your hands and go, well, I just got to get out of this and sell it. No, that is not the answer. You can yeah. actually reclaim your freedom. All you have to do is start getting paid your full fee and start reversing some of these trends. Now it's easier said than done. You got to train your team. You got to do a lot of different things, but a lot of times dentists just say, well, I'll just sell to a big DSO and relieve my problems. No, that's not true either, right? Right, and we see a lot of that, a lot of talks of that. And and no, I mean, there's a lot of things you can take back. So uh, I definitely don't want this podcast to scare all these doctors away and be like, oh my gosh, we're right. over our heads. And this certainly is, you know, but it's a sinking, sinking ship here, not the case at all. And, and really it doesn't take much to get your insurance back. Um, I like to tell everyone it's not, a sprint it is a marathon it's going to take us about six to nine months to get your insurance back to where it's paying you the way it should and and getting you on track to drop some insurances and you know really get to a good place but one year's time you can see significant changes in your ppos and and so that should be your your driving factor your first step of all we need to do is just figure out how we're getting paid can we improve it and then start making plans from there yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I, I think it's spot on. So give us your last thoughts on credentialing. You know, if you had some final thoughts on like, here's some things to think about with credentialing, what would they be? Really? I want providers to not look at, you know, Hey, credentialing used to be filling out an application and something that you could have your spouse, your mom, your brother, anybody do. And that's not how it is anymore. Credentialing is setting your practice up for long-term success. There's so much more that goes into it. So please take the time to understand the importance of credentialing and, and really do your research. Make sure you are comfortable with what you're credentialing with. Negotiate those fee schedules. Do not accept a first offer on a fee schedule ever. Um, that's a very prized per person for an insurance company is that very uh, brand new contract, that tax ID number that's never been credentialed with an insurance company, you have leverage there. So use that leverage. Don't just sign up for the first, you know, fee schedule and application they give you because you've just lost your chance to negotiate it at that point. So, um, you know, making sure that 
you are investing into what seems like an easy, let me turn it an application process really is defining your whole practice long-term. Yeah. I love it. Shelly, as always, I, I love having you on here. Now, if I'm a dentist listening and I, I want your help, how does your help work? How can you help me? What do you do and how can I find out more about what you do? Absolutely. So we're, we're on the web, so you can always find us at ppoadvisors.com. Um, but it, any provider, startup, acquisition, new provider, old provider, uh, anyone who's been in business for over two years qualifies for a free PPO analysis. So with that, we're evaluating 12 months of insurance history so we can show providers exactly what they're doing with each insurance company, find out how they're credentialed with them. So doing the hard work of actually figuring out has the most favored nations clause come into play for this insurance company, um, mapping it all out for them, laying it out in black and white, and then doing our negotiations during the free analysis so that they see new fee schedules before they invest in any services. Because if it doesn't make sense, no money should be spent. Insurance and fees are already risky enough. We really want to make sure that it's a right move, that it's an investment that's going to pay off for them and be a long-term growth investment for them. So um, that free analysis is key. Education is key. We want to be able to answer anyone's questions. This isn't a, hey, you have to be a client of ours. Call us. We'll talk insurance. We'd much rather talk to you than an insurance company anyway. So anyone that's got questions about how they're set up or what to do with their next steps or thinking about doing something, ask those questions. That's what experts are there for. Yeah, Shelly, I'm so grateful. So um, for those of you that are listening that haven't been taking notes, we take notes for you. So actually, you can flip up to the notes in Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify. You're going to see all of Shelly's contact information. You can reach out to her. I'm going to highly encourage you to do so. This landscape is very complex and too much to think about. It hurts my brain. I've been doing this for 25 years. This part still hurts my brain. You know, it's, it's, it's way too much for me to figure out. And that's why we're just so grateful to have you be part of the community. So Jelly, thanks for being on. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. So stick around when we say goodbye to everybody else, but thank you guys for listening to the best practices show. Hey, if you enjoyed today, do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends and keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys want to see. I get them all the time and we're lining them up as best we can. I'm going to have Shelly back again and again and again. Look at that. I didn't even ask you. I just told you you're coming back. So <laughs> yeah, and, you know, spe yeah, specific questions you guys want to learn, please send them to us and we'll line them up and we'll get it. Uh, we'll get those answers straight from from Shelly uh, herself. So until we see you guys next time, or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. Mm -hmm.